thank you, Candice. Our last item for today is a lecture presentation uh, on Bowls of Bengal and Rabindranath Tagore. Um, Shantanu Mitra will be giving this lecture. Uh, he is one of the six founders of Vancouver Tagore Society. And you want to say some more? <laughs> okay. yeah. Please welcome Shantanu Mitra. Thank you. Uh, I am supposed to give here my interpretation, I, I repeat, in my interpretation of the link between Bowls of Bengal and Tagore. Uh, the thing is, I have to cover a lot of ground and about, about 2,000 years of social evolution of India to really link the two together, a lot of material. So I have tried my best to compact it and remove lots of it uh, because it doesn't fit in. Uh, please pardon me if I sound a little hurried. And uh, please remember, it's my interpretation. I have not heard anybody else describe the link quite the way that I intend to do. If it doesn't tally with your, uh, with your views, please pardon me. Uh, to start with, I need to uh, define what, in my mind, makes a baul a baul. I suppose all of you know baul is a kind of a folk singer. Uh, they are from Bengal, of course. It's a region of India. And they wear certain kind of garb. Uh, they go from village to village delivering the music. They use certain kind of instruments. They have a certain style in their, in their delivery of songs and dance. They also dance while singing. Uh, but to me, these are all skin deep and superficial. They look and sound like a bowl that doesn't make a bowl. To make a bowl, he has to also follow certain belief systems, certain principles, certain delivery modes, certain lifestyles to qualify being a true bowl. And what are these? First of all, he, believe, he is supposed to embrace a principle and a belief system that, uh, that is defined as Shahajayana or Shahajan in Bengali or just Sahaja. It's a system that uh, is, uh, in Bengali is uh, credited to have given it uh, definition and, and meaning around the 8th century AD. I believe this uh, thing goes deeper and further back than that. Anyhow, it's a dual word, Saha and Ja. Saha means together, in a way, and Ja means created, and it implies things that were co-created or created simultaneously to, to get created at the same time. What does it mean? It means we humans, from birth, were created with twin identities. One, which is simple to understand, is the awareness of self, of me, I, myself. And we spend our entire life as a, a series of interaction between myself and the rest of the world. That's easy. The other definition is a more subtle one. It, it's not so apparent. It needs some introspection to find. And that defines us as not, not the selfish separate, but one part of the whole. It's part of the infinite. It, it's one with the limitless. And understanding this, realizing this, is the essence of enlightenment. You find it inside. You don't go running around all over the world to find it chasing gurus. You know? So this was a belief system that had to be adapted by the musicians as one of the prerequisites in my mind to qualify being a bowl. And that was the source of energy that would, divine, that would help them create their music. Uh, that was not all. The delivery system had twin meanings. Their, their, their songs often had twin meanings. Uh, upfront meaning was something very simple that people could relate to. Uh, for example, uh, a fisherman casting his net, e easy to relate to. But beneath that surface meaning would be much deeper one that would encourage you to delve deep inside your own soul to find the realize, uh, find your, uh, who you are, uh, that, that other identity, and be on a path to self-realization or enlightenment. So these two Twin meanings of the song was an essential delivery mechanism, and how well the bowl would weave these two together defined whether he was a good quality bowl or just an average one. And lastly, he would perform an important task in my mind to represent the conscience of the society, a society in turmoil, society having frictions or, or pressures, and, and how to find a way out uh, in, a, in a right path. So if a folk musician 
satisfied all these qualities, in my mind, he qualifies as a true bowl. If not, he just looks like a bowl, moves like a bowl, a pretend bowl, but he's got no substance. He's just, just color. So <coughs> what I want to say here is to start with is bowls didn't invent all this. They adopted all this. It, the, this, this belief system, this principle, this theories already existed and its root goes way back into our past long before bowels came into the horizon. And I need to scratch on that a little bit to establish the link with Ravindranath Tagore. By the way, somebody was talking about how to pronounce Tagore and Tagore. The way he would pronounce his last name and the way people in Bengal would is Thakur. The English anglicize it to Tagore and the Spaniards will call it Tagore. So anyway, uh, to find the link, I need to go back to the roots, which really goes uh, 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 brings me to present you a time frame which was pre-Christian, post-Vedic. I think all of you know about the Vedas. The post-Vedic uh, in the subcontinent, when there was a great exchanges taking place at the spiritual um, thoughts and, and philosophical discourse, that ended up creating uh, six major, you can say, uh, um, what do you call, uh, definitions or six major schools of thought uh, that that would uh, that would enrich the body of nascent Hinduism, and one of these schools of thought was given shape by somebody called Patanjali, and his creation was called at that time Patanjali Yoga Sutra, which is today everybody takes it as simplified as yoga, and some people even practice it around the world. Now, why do I mention it? Well, because of this twin meaning thing, on the surface for a casual observer, yoga would probably seem like some sort of a, a fitness scheme where people take up certain, uh, you're, you're expected to take up certain kind of postures and, 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 and stance and engage in some kind of breathing control exercise and so on to keep the body fit and free of disease. Well, maybe, that's on the surface. But underneath, the real goal was to prepare the mind to reach a state of uh, tranquility so that you can look past all these surface tremors and, 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 uh, and distractions and noise and delve again deep within yourself to find the path to self-realization. So you see the similarity of what Baus picked up and what this gentleman uh, did in a couple of centuries BC uh, to promote his idea of yoga. The Ulti the underlying theme was neither invented by the vows nor by Patanjali in his yoga, but they, they just picked it up on uh, something that was already synthesizing uh, on the grassroots level, going that far back. And now I bring you forward a few more centuries uh, to past the birth of Buddha, who himself went on a quest to find a solution to this endless human misery and ended up having his own enlightenment. Again, self-realization from within. Uh, he didn't have to find it from, he didn't find it from outside. And eventually he, his followers ended up creating an, a, a first major offshoot from Hinduism in the form of uh, the Buddhist faith. And that takes me uh, to uh, another body of literature under the Buddhist umbrella uh, created between uh, 8th and 12th century AD by uh, a collection of Buddhist uh, poems uh, by a number of people. The name of that uh, book is Charyapada or in Bengali Charjapad. It was composed in uh, Proto-Bengali, a, a language that is immediate ancestor of Bengali as well as related languages like Assamese, Odia and Maithili. And uh, it was adapted by Tibetans who came across the mountain wholesale um, embraced it and wrote it again in their own alphabet and took it back and practiced it for the next thousand years till today. So it goes to show that Tibet had been spiritually linked with India for a thousand years, although geographically they seem to be linked with China. And uh, this, this branch of Buddhism as expressed in Charyapada is, is described as uh, the, the Vajrayana vehicle of uh, Buddhism. There are a few other distinctions. And they, this, this method follows closely the tantric practice of Bengal. Why I mentioned this book, of, uh, this book particularly is because it clearly defines the term Sahajayana as the principle that they adopted. This twin identity, search within yourself for the, for the other one, and that is the path to realization. This 
eventually came up with people that uh, that uh, that were del that were playing with the formation of hinduism uh, picked up by these people under buddhism and uh, also in, involved people from tibet from bengal from the practice of tantra all kinds of fusions happening now i take the story further to the middle ages uh, by now the bowls the real bowls had already appeared on the scene and they were present in their music just like the way i i described and there was another group of notable uh, folk musicians that also are perhaps worth uh, mentioning they came from persia and they were islamic in faith they adopted india as their home they adopted the indian languages the food the clothing and uh, and they also believed like like bowls uh, the path to uh, spiritual salvation was through music but they also adopted wholesale this sahajayana principle and theory that the way to find answer to spiritual salvation is by looking inside and not looking uh, going all over the world outside and to find uh, the path to uh, oneness with uh, with the with the infinite uh, within the, they remain they maintain their uh, muslim faith but otherwise they are remarkably similar Uh, their music had dual meaning uh, upfront meaning was very simple and it carried deeper undertones they perform uh, represented social conscience in some sense so this this sufi group of musicians ended up being called auls a u l and the hindu branch ended up being called baul with a b and uh, both auls and bauls were in integral part of the social fabric of india of that time and now i move forward to medieval time, middle ages year 1500 and so when the next great movement uh, started out of india um, social spiritual and religious uh, that has some reference to my uh, to my uh, speech and that was spearheaded under the vaishnava vaishnavite uh, banner of hinduism by uh, somebody who is called shri chaitanya or chaitanya mahaprabhu it was a great vaishnavite uh, uh, revival vishnu is one of the hindu trinities uh, brahma vishnu and maheshwar or lord shiva vishnu being the central one and this person also created a book to define his ideas he he why did he did it is at that time in the middle ages around 1500 the existing practices of buddhism and and hinduism were picking up signs of stagnation uh, some degeneration some restrictive habits there was need for a breath, breath of fresh air uh, and as you know hinduism unlike any other main uh, religious system is not etched in one uh, specific gospel and and then you cannot move from there it had room for uh, new thoughts to uh, be implemented so he provided that and uh, he decided to write down Uh, this movement uh, in another uh, holy book and he invited another uh, uh, pandit of the time uh, advaita goswami for a series of discussions of his ideas of uh, of spirituality religion society and so on and have it recorded so that's why that book exists it's called chaitanya charitamrita it is in identifiable bengali about 500 years old and in that book sri chaitanya one of the most recent religious um, uh, gurus to come out of india uh, identifies himself as a baul and he perform he he promoted the idea that uh, lord krishna was an avatar or uh, an incarnation of vishnu so therefore uh, vaishnavite movement could be done by using krishna as a front end and his music he 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 used to sing and chant on the street with millions of followers it was a major movement of the time uh, often related to tales of love between radha and krishna and again i mention it because of this dualism uh, on one surface this 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 music about radha and krishna would simply look like a uh, mortal love between a man and a woman and we know everybody likes a love story but underneath there was a deeper uh, intonations and that was uh, humanity yearning for the law of love of divinity if i may put it radha represented humanity and krishna as an avatar of vishnu was uh, representing uh, divinity now uh, he he uh, addressed himself as a baul some people think that he did it in half jokingly i think it is he was dead serious not only that 
post Chaitanya, all the bowels of Bengal eventually converted to uh, Vaishnavism. And uh, in other words, he defined what the later bowels were supposed to be like. He, he himself was a bowel par excellence in my uh, definition. Uh, and then we come to the near modern age, uh, that is uh, the, the beginning of the Bengal Renaissance. Uh, at a time in India around, say, 1800, when Europeans had arrived at the scene, and they were uh, setting up trading posts all across the uh, all across the all of, uh, Indian coastline, and they were looking for a deep water port inland so that it could be closer to the source of all the goods that they wanted to uh, take to Europe and, and trade. And that's how the city of Calcutta uh, mushroomed out of uh, in, in the River Ganges. And along with it came the first set of Indian middle class. India didn't have a middle class. They, they were poor peasantry or powerful and rich rulers, you know. So as this businessmen and, and traders and, 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 and agents and all came up uh, to, to participate in this great uh, body of trade taking place between India and Europe and involving the Dutch, the Portuguese, the French and the British, uh, there was this affluent middle class coming up with uh, disposable income and they became the spearhead of of next series of major uh, social, religious, and spiritual reforms in India that made India or, or Hinduism brought it to the modern phase. And that was partly because they realized that uh, it has relevance to Tagore and, and Link, that's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, they realized early on that the way things were going, Hinduism and Indian lifestyle was going to come crashing against Christianity and Europeanism. And they were afraid that Hinduism as it stood at that time, will be swept off his feet because it was very old-fashioned. It had a lot of nasty practices that, that, it, that it had picked up, many bad habits, many restrictions, do's and don'ts, and, and disenfranchisement of certain people. So, so the way to, and that would be very bad for India because if they lost their religion, they will lose the link to their, uh, their mythology, their, their history, their culture, their, their heritage, their self-respect, it will be really bad for them. So the way to prevent it is not to allow the Europeans to come in, but literally to grab their Hinduism by the scruff of the neck and billing it up and, and, and force it to let go of all, this, all these bad habits. And that was easier said than done, but it was spearheaded by these people around Calcutta the, 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 at a phase that was today recognized as the golden phase or the in Bengal Renaissance. These people needed to confront a very powerful body of, of religious heads that wanted to have a stranglehold on Hinduism and how it is to be interpreted, what uh, people have to follow or not follow and so on. They had to take them on head on and beat them at their own game and not only force uh, them to acknowledge that all these things need to go, and also take the control of the religion out of these people's hand and set it free. So they, the fact that they survived uh, or they succeeded itself is a sort of a miracle. And as a result, uh, the, the reformed Hinduism, partially reformed Hinduism, uh, came no with, uh, sooner with, with Christianity and uh, prevented getting a, uh, a bloody nose. So, why I mention it is this, is this few generations of Bengal Renaissance, the Tagore family was very intimately involved with all this, and Rabindranath Tagore himself was a third generation. He saw this happening around him, you know, and they were heavily influenced by exposure to all kinds of Indian culture so that each uh, learns the other and appreciates the total thing. It is not a monolithic uh, uh, society. So he was exposed to uh, uh, Sufi music. He was exposed to uh, Baal music. He was exposed to other kind of ethnic music, uh, tribal music, and, and, and all kinds of music. He, he was exposed to Islam. He was exposed to English language, uh, Christianity, and, uh, and European lifestyle. He, he, he was very good in Sanskrit, so he would absorb directly from Vedas and Upanishads, all the uh, spiritual resources, and, and compose his own music and sing it uh, on stage, uh, even when he was in his mid-teens. So why I mention all that is his link and uh, influence and this Tagore and Baal, it was not at the surface, it was not Tagore of his time taking sustenance for Baal of that time. But both Bauls and Tagores took their enrichment from the same root sources that went way back into, uh, into the past. Now, his music, uh, Tagore wrote uh, 2,000 odd songs, so his music, some of them are recognized today as 
bowel-like, but I, I leave them aside, but they are, because they are only superficially bowel-like. Uh, they sometimes have tunes that mm, appear to be like bowels. But there are a whole lot of other music that he created, uh, not recognized as bowel-like, but to me, they are proofs that he himself was at heart a bowel par excellence. And uh, a whole lot of his music that he categorized as spiritual, even today, people readily mistake it while the Hamid thinking it's a love song. All Tagore was doing was addressing his concept of the Almighty, but it looked like I'm, I, I'm imagining a lover, you know, a physical lover. So why it was that he used the same twin meaning, but he wove the two so intricately, so wonderfully, so seamlessly, that even today people make mistake and take one for the other. Uh, in my mind, uh, leave the music aside now, uh, take all his dance dramas and plays, uh, he did not make them on trivia. He, he took very important, relevant social issues of the time, whether it's women's empowerment or, or, or caste system and this and that. And he used them as another vehicle to tickle the conscience of the society. He was performing the task that is we expect out of a bowl, but in a much grander scale. Uh, and in his plays, all of them on critically socially relevant issues, he brought in many characters, bowel-like characters, like for instance, uh, Dhananjay Vairagi. Vairagi is an is Indian name for a wandering uh, holy man, uh, or grandfather uh, representing some sort of a wise old man, or blind bowel. All these people have minor roles, smaller roles in this uh, socially critical pace, but they perform the task of tickling the conscience of a society in turmoil, or society in confusion, society in, in, in looking for a way out. Uh, and so that was his duty again being as, as a bowel, I would say. Leave that aside and come to the vast body of prose that he created in, in more than one language. And there he performs direct critique of the, uh, he, he becomes the conscience of a society and provides direct critique of our civilization. And I will mention just one, as I'm running out of time, uh, is a lecture that he, he, he delivered in person, read it out in English, and it's titled Robbery of the Soil, 1922. What did he do there? He, it was a direct critique of society and not just India, uh, Bengal or India, it was a whole global. Uh, so he was criticizing the developmental model of the West that the rest of the world was, uh, was desperate to pick up and adopt. And he saw a future where this model was going to hurtle the Earth, planet Earth he's talking about, uh, recklessly towards a dead end where all that will be left is a hollow shell and debris and junk. Not able, the planet itself will not be able to sustain life anymore. Why? because we are exploiting the resources of the planet at a breakneck speed. We have created a religion of worshiping wealth to a such giddy levels, a huge, uh, unbelievable amount of wealth, in, uh, material wealth in the hand of a uh, few, uh, where wealth itself is becoming antisocial, where, where nations will wage war against each other just to sort out who has the right to plunder how much of the planet, how fast. Now, imagine 1922. Environmental sustainability was in nobody's radar at that time. There are many more he did, but in my mind, he was a bowel par excellence, just like Chaitanya Dev was a bowel of his time in the year 1500, uh, Tagore was a bowel of, of, of the 20th century, and in my definition, he was the last of the last of the true bowels. Why? Because the society changed so rapidly since then that we, the society have no room nor any capacity to absorb true bowels. We do not get our information from them. We get it from television. We do not decide what we need or do not need from them. We do it from advertisement. We do not have the mental setup to actually absorb true bowels anymore. So therefore, he was the last of the last. Since the society didn't have any room for true bowels, true bowels went extinct. extinct. What we have is, is, is make-believe bowels. And he was the last final torch bearer of a lamp that was lit more than 2,000 years ago. And the lamp is now no more because we, the people, have no room for it and need for it anymore. That brings me to the end of my link with Baal Center Goes. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Shantanu Mitro. It's like completely different insight. Like I was never thinking about in this uh, in this li uh, light, um, and would uh, like would have liked to like hear more about uh, from you. But we are running out of time. So with that, uh, we are going to wrap up today's uh, program. But we are not going to end the festival today because it's a two days, uh, two days um, uh, festival that uh, continues tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have the cultural performances starting at six in the main stage in the auditorium. You are all invited. It's a free admission program. Bring your friends, your families, uh, strangers. I, anybody is um, uh, is uh, in, um, welcome. So, with that, uh, I'm going to end the program today, and we'll uh, vacate this room uh, immediately. Uh, the people will start cleaning up, and uh, Shantanu Mitra and other poets would be out in the lobby if you want to talk to them. Um, you are most welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Bernice, for the host. Uh, for hosting the program today. All the poets, congratulations to all the poets, the winners, the, the others, and the uh, uh, invited poets. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Enrico, for your um, beautiful music. Keka and Taposh are not here because they are actually rehearsing for tomorrow's program, which, is the, which will be in a grand scale compared to the music today. So with that, I say good night and See you tomorrow.